Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect, everybody. I'm DDP, and today we are going to be talking about a new Maverick that I think has some real intrigue. I'm talking, of course, about Rashawn Holmes, because this is a guy who has been on Mavs fans' radar for several years now, and now he's finally here. His stock has been a little bit down the last year and a half, two years, but is that because of a decline? Or is that because of a situational fit? We'll talk about that today. So the Mavericks acquired Rashawn Holmes on draft night as they swung a deal with the Sacramento Kings. It allowed Sacramento to trade back, which also allowed Dallas to acquire Omax Prosper. For that reason alone, that's a slam dunk move, in my opinion. But it gets even better. First of all, the fit we're talking about today is Rashawn Holmes. Omax, that's a separate video. We've already kind of talked about it. Maybe we'll delve deeper later. But for now, we're going to talk about Holmes. Rashawn Holmes is 29 years old. He's a former second-round pick from the 2015 draft. I want to say pick 37. And he's not your traditional big. He's a power forward center, sure. But he's only six foot eight. Depending on the source you look at, maybe basketball reference, I'll list him at 6'10. He's not 6'10. He's not. He's 6'8 with a 7'1 wingspan, and he's 235. That's not really a traditional big. And for the more modern small ball type NBA game, yeah, that can work. But here's why Rashawn Holmes is such an interesting fit. Because we're talking about a guy who, yes, he might be a little bit undersized. But he is effective when he's actually had opportunity. It's been the last year and a half that that opportunity has kind of dwindled. He's been kind of buried on that front court depth chart for the Kings behind Sabonis and uh, a much less agreeable one to be stuck behind Alex Lynn. Yeah, okay, fair enough. But it is a guy who is in a career 8.9 points, 5.4 boards while shooting 60.6% from the field. He's not a great three-point shooter. That is something that in the past I mentioned as a possibility for him. That was maybe three years ago I was talking about that being a late developing thing. Now he's on, he's eight years as a pro and he's still a career 27.3% three point shooter. I'm not really holding my breath on that. It can, it can happen, but it's not going to be a thing that you see a lot in his game. He's not going to be a stretch five. He's also a 74.7% free throw shooter and his efficient, uh, effective field goal percentage is 61.5%. That's the good stuff. Last season, with, again, reduced minutes, played at about 45 games, he had 3.1 points per game, 1.9 boards, 0.2 assists, down from a career average of one assist per game. 61.8% uh, from the field, so again, still effective there. Actually an uptick compared to his career numbers. And the real, the real um, oddball here, the standout, that it's not indicative of his attempts, is the three-point percentage at 62.5%. He, he attempted a three... He, he attempted 0.2 three-pointers per game. Attempted. So, yeah, it, it's not really a sizable body of work to look from. That said, he does have some real positive points that are interesting. First and foremost, he's got good bounce. He's got a good feel inside of the paint, including a very high proficiency... A uh, little jump hook or push shot, really more of a push shot than even a true jump hook or a baby hook. And it is it is borderline patented for him at this point. Like he is nails, like high mid to high 60% range on that shot. And I'm not just talking about in the restricted area. I'm not just talking about the middle of the paint. I mean, he can back that SOB out to the free throw line and this dude still converts at a ridiculously high clip for his goofy little shot. So, yes, he can space the floor just a little bit. Maybe not out to the perimeter for like a, a stretch five or anything like that, but he can stretch the floor just a little bit. And you see that used a lot by Sacramento in the past. Kind of a pick and pop situation. He'll pick, start to roll to the basket, and then just stop on a dime, catch the ball, and take that little push shot from six to eight feet out. And it's just like, hmm, not a lot of guys have that style of offense. As such, he gets wide open looks more often than not with it. I like it. That's that's unique. Sometimes unique is all you need to, to throw a wrench in the opposing team's plans. It doesn't have to be that you're sensational or that you're a wicked good athlete. By the way, wicked good, 
man, I need to cut back on the coffee. It can just be that it's unique and unusual and just enough to just throw the defender off or make them have to think just a little bit more and try to react as opposed to just going with the more natural flow of what's anticipated. He's also a very good shot blocker. That's one thing I'm very excited about. He's not, he's not going to like lead the league in blocks or anything like that, but he's a very solid shot blocker because even though he is only six foot eight, he has a seven, one wingspan. He has good bounce. Uh, not, not like crazy vertical or anything like that. I want to say it's like 34, 35 inch vertical. It's that he has good athleticism, good quickness and that long wingspan. So he's able to defend a lot of shots, bother a lot of shots because of his size. He's able to stick with uh, a wide a range of uh, uh, players that he goes against. It doesn't matter. He, it's not like he's limited to just guarding the bigs on the other team. He can stay a little bit in space with some of these small forwards and guys like that. So you do have those opportunities for Rashawn Holmes. All of that is very good. He's physical in the paint. He's got a good nose for the ball when it's in the air. It's not out of the ordinary to see him go up in a crowd of bodies and come down with the ball and then fight through it to get a good, you know, draw contact and get to the line. If not convert and get to the line, he does good work. He is a, he's a very intriguing uh, addition there because those are all things Dallas really, really needed. What I also like is that he can put the ball on the deck and straight line, get where he wants to go. This is not like the old Kristaps Porzingis disaster where literally every time he tried to put the ball on the deck, it got away from him because it was getting stripped or he was dribbling it off his knee or what have you. He can actually manage and get where he wants to go and make things happen. Doesn't mean that he's got a lot of shiftiness or that he's going to cross you over, but straight line, he'll get where he wants to go, and he's proficient at it. He also makes some pretty good quick decisions with the ball, whether or not uh, it's out of the pick and roll. It doesn't always mean that he has to just create his own shot. He can actually find guys and make smart plays very quick before the defense has a chance to reset, which is all very good. Now let's get into some of the concerning things. He fell out of the rotation, as I mentioned earlier, in Sacramento, right as the team was really finally coming up out of the, the basement of the Western Conference and reaching real relevance again. And a lot of that had to do with DeMontis Sabonis uh, kind of changing the equation there. Once Sabonis came over, Rashawn Holmes became a little bit redundant there. And because of his size, it wasn't really a good pairing. So his role kind of reduced to the point where he struggled to actually get consistent minutes. You also had inconsistency with his availability. And this is something that extends beyond just the last couple of years. In the last two seasons combined, Rashawn Holmes has played 87 total games. Just barely a full season. That is concerning. If you look back to when people really want to look back and say like, oh, but look how good he was and it wasn't that long ago. True. If you look back to his, what, age 27 season, 2020, 2021 season, he played in 61 games. Keep in mind, that was the pandemic shortened season of 72 games. So he played in all but 11 games he could have played in that year. That's really good. However, that's kind of the outlier. If you look at his career, I think aside from his third year where he played like 70 games, he had another season with 61. Uh, I just mentioned it, the 61 games in 2020, 2021. Outside of that, he really hasn't played more than 45 games since the 2018-19 season. This is a guy whose availability is a bit of a problem. And as I mentioned earlier, again, a subpar outside shooter, despite having a very solid mid-range game, his three-point shooting is not strong, below average. Um, although there are opportunities where, because it's expiring shot clock or whatever, if you're going to have a big taking a shot, it's not the worst one to have out there, but it is what it is. So the availability to me is a much bigger concern. If you're talking about a guy who... You know, some fans are trying to talk themselves into him being potentially a starter for this team. I don't think it'll be there with any consistency if his availability isn't better. You can say what you want about the last two years. But again, in an eight year career, the fact that we have two years of good availability and the other years are all kind of half ish. That's that's not good. That That's concerning. That leads me to believe that he's a guy that usually is working through some sort of, you know, aches and pains or dings, bruises, whatever. So that's that's a concern. There's also, I think, with how things in Sacramento kind of went, while he could be effective at times, I think other times um, 
that motor wasn't always where you wanted it. That could again be disenfranchised with his diminishing role. I don't know, but this is in general, a very good athlete to add to the team. If a bit undersized, he, he addresses the defense that you want again at 29 years old, he still has a, a decent measure of youth. You're not talking about a guy that's no tread left on the tires. As far as the mileage is concerned, he's got quickness and a leaping ability and a wingspan that allows him to overcome a lot of that um, subpar size. And aside from his availability being a concern, I think you do have a guy who could be situationally a starter, certainly a guy that could contribute to your rotation. I don't know if that means he's going to be a consistent starter, even with health, because maybe his size is enough that Dallas wants to still stick with the more traditional looking starting five and you end up still with just death taxes and Dwight Powell starting at center for the Mavericks. But one thing I do see with Rashawn Holmes is at the very least, he is going to act as a, a capable, effective buffer for this team while they continue to develop Derek Lively uh, the second, because that is a general consensus with Lively is that he's got the tools and he can absolutely be that guy with time, but I don't think he's going to be that guy first year. I really don't. I think he can be a good rotation player, a guy that plays maybe 10 minutes a game and gives you some good energy plays, some good defensive plays. But I think there's going to be some growing pains and having a guy like Rashawn Holmes ahead of him, even though, again, he's not of the same size, I think is at least going to give you depth and allow you to give some time for Lively to develop without him having to be thrown into the fire. The fire in this situation, when you throw young guys to the fire, more often than not, it burns them and it ruins them. It doesn't it, it doesn't make them better. You, you break more guys than you make trying to do that. There's been, look at how many lottery picks have been thrown into those situations, even on bad teams where you're thinking, oh, they're going to have, they can do whatever they want because they have all the time to develop. They don't have to worry about this or that. They don't have to worry about competing or being relevant right now. They can just hone their craft and it still breaks them because they're the focal point of attention. They're the defensive assignment assignments shifted in their direction. And now teams are game planning against them specifically at a level that they've never experienced. It breaks more guys than it makes. So this I think will allow you to shield lively a little bit. It gives you a guy who I don't know if stop gap is the right term in this case, but at the very least, I think you got a guy who for a couple of years can be a good rotation player for you and whose fit is rather unique among front court guys. Sometimes with Dallas and how they've built rosters in the past, You've looked at it and you've seen certain redundancies where you're like, all right, well, you've got this type of guy here. And then you have this guy and this guy who kind of do the same thing just to a varying degree. Dallas with this has a more unique fit that I do think can add a little bit of something. If nothing else, just having a, a pick and roll option that is unique and more of a rarity in uh, across the league, I think it's a very, very good thing. Uh, that you certainly can't be upset about. And I mentioned earlier the the trade to acquire him. So it was that draft night deal. First Dallas trades back uh, with OKC to go from 10 to 12. That allows them to still get their guy lively while shedding Berton's contract. That gives them then like a $17 million essentially trade exception so that they can make another trade and the salaries don't have to match up. That's what basically allowed Dallas to then, when Sacramento didn't get their guy, do the same type of deal where in Sacramento gave up Rashawn Holmes and Dallas was able to move back up in their place to get Omax prosper. You got prosper and you got a guy who, like I said, it is an interesting, intriguing X factor for this roster. I think so effectively, even though it took two trades to do it, you effectively turned Davis Bertans into Rashawn Holmes and Omax prosper. If you want to look at something and say why I think Nico is having a, a just insanely good off season, talk all you want about last year. I have been right there with you, very vocal and frustrated and even pissed off at times about how the Jalen Brunson situation was handled. All of that. In the scope of just this season, I am damn impressed with what Dallas is doing. And I think this is another great move for them. It doesn't have to be that it's that it's a foundational piece to this team for the next five, six, seven years, whatever you're still looking at this and saying, do you move apart from your roster that was borderline unplayable and paying a lot of money? 
and hard to move in any other circumstance. Yes. Do you add a guy that brings in energy and defense and is a capable score in the mid range, things that you really needed um, and didn't have, especially that defensive energy and everything. Yes. Do you maintain flexibility in the big picture? Yes. And you obtained another asset that allowed you to go get another primo prospect that you wanted and one who I think can have an even higher ceiling in that. Yes. It's a, it's an A plus. This trade is an A plus for me. And I think Rashawn Holmes is a, is a fascinating thing. Even if Rashawn Holmes fit in Dallas doesn't work out. I give this trade an A if it fits and it's, you know, similar at all to what we saw a couple of years ago from him, then I think it's a very, very strong A plus, but this is another masterful move on Nico's part. Again, I'll do another video talking about Nico compared last year, compared to this year, where we're looking and things like that. But for the scope of this off season, this trade, this acquisition, this was one of those first things. I the lively trade back was nice. This was the first thing this off season that Dallas did where I was like, oh, damn, that's savvy. That's that's smart. That's that's ballsy. And that's well done, because like I said, we've known and had interest in Rashawn Holmes for a while now, like two, three years. Mavs Twitter has been talking about him to finally get him and to do so while his stock is on a little bit of a down tilt, not. I, again, I don't think it's in the gutter, but it, it's down a bit. So to get that and the pick that would become Omax. Oh, that is, that's fire. I don't care who you are. That's fire. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Is Rashawn Holmes going to be Dallas's, in your opinion, starting option? Best starting option at the center position? Or is there a different lineup where we might see Holmes at the power forward spot? Let me know. Leave a comment, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!